Amen. That's right. I invite you to turn to Psalm 27. That's the psalm we just sang a few moments ago. It's one of my favorite psalms. It just has so much good stuff to strengthen the heart in it. It says that this is a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in His temple. For He will hide me in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I'll offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. And my heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. Or you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my mother and my father have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful psalm of devotion to you, of drawing near to you, of, of, of finding in you the, the strength and courage needed for our weak and timid lives. So we pray, may your Holy Spirit use it in the hearts and minds of your people to transform them. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we are a frail and fearful people. We see, we hear, and sometimes we sense threats to our lives. Currently, we are faced with the COVID-19 epidemic. Societal riots breaking loose, people acting out in undependable and scary ways that they had not in the past. We, day in and day out, do not know whether some accident, whether it be a car accident or some other kind of accident, may occur in our lives. Accusations sometimes threaten our sense of well-being. And we feel reduced. We feel like we're vulnerable and easy prey. We feel fearful living in a world that's so precarious in our lives. It's a wonder we're not more a bundle of nerves than we are already. <laughs> Anything could happen and we can't control it. And when we lose that sense, when we lose that sense of God's favor and closeness, what happens? The sense of fragility and fear arises. It's almost like they're, they stand in proportion to each other uh, in opposition. The more we sense the closeness and nearness of God in our souls, the less we are afraid and fearful and nervous. So when, when God is seen by us as the great and sovereign king. And we have a sense of his favor. That fear just dissipates. It melts, doesn't it? 
Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is that kind of a psalm. It's a tonic. It's a balm for your soul. It's a psalm that directs you to that very thing you so desperately need, to draw near to Him. To have the courage and the strength that only comes from that relationship with God in your life. So let us, let us receive this psalm. Let us say, let us say as, as Covenant URC, I believe Psalm 27 this morning. I want Psalm 27 to guide my thoughts. I want to draw out of Psalm 27 the strength and the courage that God has here for me. First of all, let's consider the comparison that David makes in verses 1 through 3. The Lord's my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, I will not be confident. David compares confidence in God to the threat of people in his life. What's that comparison look like? He calls them evildoers in this psalm. He calls them adversaries. At one place, a difficult Hebrew word to translate is actually the word that means watchers. Your enemies are watchers. They're watching you. Keep an eye on you to see when you're going to finally fall. That's verse 12. It's translated as adversaries here in the ESV because of the difficulty of that word. False witnesses who breathe out violence. These people wish to harm him. They watch him. They're looking for some fault, some defect, some misstep that they can capitalize on and accuse him and attack him. Bring him down. And those who so posture themselves feel right in their attack. They feel there's a, there's a moral superiority they have over him that they can accuse and take him down. They are, feel like, well, we're taking out the trash. It's only right to accuse and bring this person to justice. But they're talking about who? They're talking about David. <laughs> they're talking about the king, God's servant, God's songwriter, the man after God's own heart. But David does not fear the attack. He does not fear these accusers, these witnesses, the, those who can testify to his sin. These folks who would take him down by capitalizing on some Achilles heel in his life. These, these watchers who are looking for the chink in his armor. Why? Why does he not fear them? It's because of the comparison between them and his God. The Lord is his light and salvation, he says, right out of the chute. He's the Lord. He's the Lord that he's in covenant relationship with. He's the, the Lord who's made, and made him, anointed him king. Who is this Lord? He's the sovereign Lord. That's who he is. He's in control of all this stuff. And he is gracious to him. And he is his Lord. That's the covenant. That's the beauty of it. Hope you believe in covenant. Hope you believe in covenant theology. That's good stuff. God is my God. I am His. That's covenant, you see. David was confident in that relationship and in the, and in the God of sovereignty that he was bound to. He had his mind and his heart in the right place. He knew that God not only ruled, he also knew that God ruled the wicked. Amazing. David just didn't have a book about God. He did. He was supposed to meditate it. Remember Deuteronomy 17. He's supposed to be reading it daily as God's king. But he not only had the book about God, he had the God of the book. And he was safe in God's hands. He was at peace. There was no comparison between God's greatness and the threats around him. Secondly, David says this great God was his light. His light. He would guide him through the dark. God would shine his light into his own life, show him his sin. I don't need the help of you angry accusers who are just looking for a defect to knock me off. I got God's light. It'll shine into me. 
shine in my own darkness. But not only that, but God's light would shine in to the darkness ambient in David's life that he might navigate, he might find a way through darkness and uncertainty. David is able to see by this light from God the difference between a useful and loving witness like Nathan, the prophet, in his life versus all these other reckless accusers that didn't care a fig for him. God was his light. He could detect darkness when it disguised itself as if it was light, accusing him of sin. And then thirdly, as he comes out of the shoot here in the very first word, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I mean, Savior, actually. God is my Savior. God had saved David from his sin. And God, being the sovereign God, would also save him from sinners. By way of the covenant of grace, David lived his life in dependence upon God's forgiving grace, a grace he saw in the Passover lamb, a grace he was able to see in the sacrifices particularly the sin offering, the guilt offering, that God was gracious and forgiving, and he knew it. Because God was light, he trusted God to guide and illumine his path. David knew that he belonged to God, and David knew that this God to whom he belonged had forgiven him. David lived under these realities these were not remote concepts. These were not things that, here's my theology. They were, but they were his life. He fed and he drank and was nurtured by these realities. That's why he could say what he says here. Do you know God the Father's sovereignty in your life? Do you believe that? Do you believe in the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe the Holy Spirit is able to illumine you within and without with regard to the kinds of things that you have to deal with in life? Well, if you do, then you can be like David. You can have share in his reality. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? My heart shall not fear. I will be confident. I'll be strong and courageous in the Lord. Notice verse 3. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Remember, th- you ever imagine what that would be like? And wake up some morning and you look out in your front lawn, and there's about 500 people camp in camo with guns pointing at you as you step out your front door. What would you think? <laughs> How would you respond? <laughs> it sounds like, is, is this hyperbole? <laughs> Army in camp, war, I will be confident. It's true. It's true. It was true for David, it was true for Stonewall Jackson, southern general. They called him Stonewall Jackson. He says, look at him there. He's like a stone wall. In the midst of battle, he was composed. Some of his troops asked him, why are you so calm? battle's raging. Well, the same God I'm with in my bed is the same God I'm with on my saddle in the midst of this battle. Same God. I'm a calm. I'm at peace in Him. This is not just hyperbole. This is reality. Imagine if the worst case scenario showed up at your door. Imagine that if it happened and you came and looked out and saw that. At 9 p.m., King David put on his PJs. He said his prayers. He thanked God for being in his everlasting arms, a fatherly love, and then right before he climbs into bed, he peeks out the window, and there, poised for attack, A spread out army encamped. He looks, he smiles, 
He blows out the candle. He thanks God like the weaned child who rests upon its mother in Psalm 131. And he crawls into bed and he sleeps like a baby. Though an army, though a war, I shall not fear. What do you say? Do you, uh, do you want David's God? Do you want David's faith? Do you want this kind of confidence, composure, strength, courage? Well, the psalm doesn't end here. Verses 4 through 6 is as if David is saying, hey, here's my secret. This, this is what I'm about. This is why I do not fear. Here it is. You want to know, you want to know what it is? It's go to church. <laughs> That's the answer. Go to church. <laughs> One thing I've asked of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me up upon a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies all around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. How in the world can going to church have anything to do with helping you to sleep like a baby when rioters are in the streets? When trouble is afoot, because if you know why you are going to church, it will make the difference. And what is that difference that going to church will make? Going to church, in truth, is an eschatological moment of life. And I don't mean just to sling big words around either. Because it is. Going to church is a redemptive historical advance, is an ascent up Mount Zion, the Mount of Transfiguration. It is a present, though temporary, relocation of your soul into the place where you will spend eternity, heaven. It's an entering in. It's a drinking and eating of heavenly things. It will not leave you untouched. You will be changed. Church is an earthly visit to heaven. I don't know if you thought of that when you came to church this morning. But I hope you did. Because that's what it is. It's an earthly visit to heaven that is transforming it was made to change how you view trouble and how you respond to it. It's where we seek the one thing. The one thing that changes everything. Think about this for a moment. The biblical reason and rationale for church. The word church means assembly. It's an assembly of the covenant community to do what? To draw near to God in heaven. You read the book of Hebrews, that drawing near to God in heaven in the new covenant is not drawing near to him on an earthly level, which is typological in the old. It's a heavenly drawing near, an actual ascension and entrance through the body and blood of Jesus, Hebrews 10. And thus we should come to fix our attention upon one thing, to gaze upon the one thing that the Father through the resurrected and heavenized Son of God, we gaze upon Him through Christ. And in gazing by faith, we see something. Faith are eyes. Eyes that are able to detect and penetrate the invisible. And therein see the beauty, the delightfulness, the glory, the wonder of the Lord. And that's why, the, that's why the book of Hebrews tells us to come with reverence and awe. As we read in chapter 12, it, it means to ascend Mount Zion. It means we come and we are transported and we are transformed by what we see in Christ 
when we gather. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says when we look upon the translated, transformed Jesus Christ, it, that look is transforming in nature that changes us from glory where Christ is to glory in our lives, in our hearts. This is what the believer is to do all the days of his life. All the days of the life throughout his earthly journey. He is to keep peeking in week after week into his ultimate destination. Every first day he comes and then on a cycle every seven days on that first day of the week he comes and he tastes and he sits at the table of the Lord and he feasts on him in expectation of the ultimate heavenly marriage supper of the Lamb. The covenant community who is faithful in this will be transformed by it, changed by it, or they will come under judgment by it. Just showing up every Sunday will not transport you to heaven, unfortunately. You read the book of Hebrews, you'll find the author of the Hebrews is very concerned that when the visible community gathers, some people don't move. Some people do not mix the promises with faith. Some people come up to the edge of the promised land, Hebrews chapter 3, but they don't really enter in because of unbelief. But those who do come in faith draw near to Christ in glory with the people of God and gaze upon His glory, and therein they taste and they find that the Lord is good and that He is glorious. We can taste of the age to come. As I said, it's an eschatological moment. It's a moment of the future. It's a moment of another world that we temporarily enter into as the people of God in this life. And it is a small taste, a small indicator that Jesus is on His way in the second coming when there will be the final gathering of the church in the presence of Jesus Christ. To gaze upon him, and John assures us that when that look occurs, it will not just change our bodies, our, our souls, but it will change our bodies. We will be fashioned after him, for we shall see him as he is. And that means every time we gather together, what are we seeking to do? I'm seeking to leave behind the troubles and the tears of this life. Yes, they won't leave me alone. We come and they cling to us and they get into our minds and they won't let go of us. And we come to church and we've got to definitively say, when I walk through that door, troubles and tears and whatever in life, I'm leaving you outside. I'll deal with you later. Right now, I'm going to focus on God. That's church. David says in verses 5 and 6 that the Lord will... Lift me up upon a rock. Lift me up. It says, verse 6, he, he will lift up my head. My head will be lifted up. Lift me up upon a rock, a high place, a, a transcendent place, a heavenly place that, that's unmovable and firm. This world is not firm. This world is movable. As Hebrews 12 tells, it's shakable. So shakable that the day will come and it will be removed. But the heavenly world is not shakable. It's a kingdom to which you belong. It's a kingdom that you get to receive every Sunday. Hebrews chapter 12. My head will be lifted up where God is worshipped with sacrifices and with song. My head, my mind, my point of view becomes changed because it enters into a completely different perspective. A, a perspective that's informed by heaven's light. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul after opening up the richness of the gospel, the richness of grace, 1 through 11, comes to chapter 12, and it's as if he says, okay, 
here should be your response to the great grace of God in the gospel. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Actually, that <clears throat> word should be rational. It comes from logos, your rational, reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal. By the renewal of your mind. This is the response to the gospel, Paul says, based on the mercies of God. Present your bodies based upon what? Upon the fact that Christ has lived a perfect life. Christ has borne your sins. Christ has risen from the dead. And that grace is now applied to you by the Holy Spirit. Now on the basis of these mercies, here's what you should do in response. What? Present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Consecrate your lives that are in union with the living Christ as living sacrifices. Now the marvelous thing about this text is that there's the word bodies is your bodies is plural. But the sacrifice is singular. So when we come to worship, what happens in worship? We gather together as many bodies, but we unite to make a single sacrifice as the covenant community, as the body of Christ to God. Paul says this is what? Your reasonable, logical service of worship. In other words, it follows from God's grace to you in Jesus Christ and the gospel to logically, rationally, by way of deduction, now to respond in worship corporately. And in that worship, what happens, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Why? Because you're entering into another world in worship. We're not just reproducing the culture. You've probably been to some churches where it looks like what's going on in the church is the same thing that goes on in the culture. What's the diff, you know? Uh, Paul said, don't be conformed. This is supposed to be a moment of a heavenly reality, different from the world. Don't be conformed to this world. But what? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Mind renewal. He lifts up the mind unto another plane and as he lifts the minds of his people up to another plane, those, man, those minds are metamorphosized. That is the Greek word, by the way. Transform. It's metamorphosis. Which we get our word metamorphosis. It's the same word when Jesus was on Mount of Transfiguration. That word is metamorphosis. His body was metamorphosized before their eyes upon the mount. It was heavenized. Paul is picking up upon this heavenly change that occurs in our point of view about our existence in this world and who we are as we pass through it. The mind is heavenized. No wonder Paul says, fix your mind where? On things above. For Christ is, Colossians 3, one. There is a proportioned ratio at work here. The more you fix your mind on heaven, the less you'll be driven by fear on earth. The nearer to God, the further from fear. We, in, we assemble here. We assemble here not to see what the preacher is wearing. We assemble here not to feel good about some peppy songs. We assemble here not because my friends are there and I wouldn't want to miss them. We assemble here to engage heaven. We assemble here because here he lifts up our minds and sets us up on not just a rock, but a mountain, Mount Zion to dazzle us, to draw us into a view of glory 
a glory that is embodied in Jesus, whose body was heavenized, metamorphosized in his resurrection. This is a safe place, this heavenly place. There God throws his canopy of protection uniquely over you and me. And here as we gather to behold him, here as we gather to do that one thing, Psalm 27, David speaking on Psalm 27, tells us that he cries out to the Lord. And you come to church, and I look out over you, I'm the one doing all this talking and leading, and I'm busy. What are you doing? Some people say, well, I'm not doing anything. And I hope you can say, I'm not just sitting here like a bump on the wall. I'm praying. I'm saying, oh God. And they offer a prayer. Oh Lord, thank you. Lord, teach me. I hope you can say, I'm praying when I gather. I'm responding to God because I've been called to the one thing here. If you come to church and you go, I'm so bored. Okay, I'll go to church to endure a couple hours of boredom this morning before I go home and do what I really want to do. That's a sad affair. That's a sad, sad affair. Because your mind has not been transformed yet. Your heart hasn't been engaged yet. And so when David came and worshipped, he was engaged Hear, O Lord, when I cry out. Be gracious to me. Answer me, verse 7. You said seek my face. Here I am, seeking your face as you've asked me to. So what, Lord? Don't hide your face from me. Draw me near. Don't cast me off, O God of my salvation. An earnest prayer, an earnest seeking, not an amusement making. Now, you know what amusement is, right? Amuse, not muse, not thinking. That's amusement. We come here to muse, to think, to engage our minds before God. We pray for that covenant relationship that should be so dear to us. Was it not dear to Mary when Martha was so busy clattering all kinds of pans, getting that lunch together? Was it not so dear to her? Jesus said to her when she complained about not getting much help, hold off. She's got the one thing necessary. Don't sever that. Leave her be. We come and we pray for our relationship with Christ to grow, to be richer. We long for more. that We might find that closeness and that comfort in that closeness spiritually in our lives. In verse 10, David says, My father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. You know, boy, those, he's got bad parents. <laughs> Just dropped him off, you know. No. I think the sense of this is this is the natural order of life. You grow up. And your father and mother are no longer doting over you when you're 30 years old. They're no longer saying, okay, it's time to do this, it's time to do that, and, and all that. They, they, they let you go. Just like a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. You grow up. Your parents forsake you. But what's supposed to happen? When that relationship changes gear, what's supposed to happen? Those parents had supposed to have been teaching you to pray. Teaching you to look to God in your life. Hey, son, I'm not always going to be here. Hey, son, I'm not all that dependable. Hey, I know you thought I was a, a, your hero when I was six, but now you're 26. You get it. I'm frail. Don't look to me anymore. Look to the Lord like I do. My father and mother have forsaken me. They've done what they're supposed to do. I've grown up. What? The Lord will take me in. I don't stop getting parented. <laughs> but now I have my father as God. That's what David is saying here, you see. He's crying out to him and he's graduating from uh, the, the earthly to the heavenly place that parents that love God point their children. And 
hopefully our children will take those pointers. But also David, in verse 11, says, Teach me your way. David did not only pray, talk to God, but God spoke to David. He taught him his way. He instructed him. What communion with God is this? We come to church because He's your covenant God. We come to church to enter the heavenly arena through the body and the blood of Jesus and commune with our God, to locate our minds in that place of transformation. And I engage in a covenantal dialogue with God. I pray to Him. He speaks to me through His Word. And I am lifted up. My point of view has changed. My point of view has changed. I look out the window before I go to bed at night and there's an army out there. But guess what? My point of view is different. I will not fear. It's just an army. And God's got me in His hands. Oh, to have that point of view. Oh, to commune with heaven. To be transported and transformed as we fix our minds on Christ crucified and risen in worship. One thing we seek, one thing in sacrifice, one thing in song, one thing in scripture, one thing in supplication, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to ascend Mount Zion, cast off fears, cast off trouble, and focus upon the Lord of sovereign grace and draw near, so that together, together, it's a covenant community effort and reality, so that together we step into the world above, the world beyond, the higher world. And here what we do, we reset our calipers for life. Because it is here that Jesus comes forward and the world recedes backward from our vision and it is transforming. When they did the Trinity Psalter hymnal, they left out some songs I liked that was in the Trinity. That's okay. I can still go back to them. But I end on this one. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us pray.